I'm a bit surprised the Kingston Rules story isn't a more widely known and he isn't more significantly thought of as a Melbourne Cup winner apart from being the fastest ever and people sort of think oh, he was the fastest ever at a time when tracks were fast and it'll never be beaten because tracks aren't that fast anymore. That doesn't give him the credit he deserved uh, and there's of course the backstory with Bart Cummings, having had a hiatus out of not winning the cup, people doubted he'd ever win it again. Uh, the horse coming from America, Bart's financial woes. Um, yeah, just a lot of, you know, even Darren Beedman part of the story. Uh, you know, the first time Beedman ever really made a big significant impact in Melbourne. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful story and uh, worth telling. Dad's record of breeding and racing champion horses in the Kingston Park colours is truly something extraordinary. Over a mere 20 years from the late 70s to up until 2000, Dad bred small crops of horses and raced most of them. He had, I think, 13 individual Group 1 winners over that period who won uh, in excess of 30 races between them and almost innumerable group two and three and stakes winning horses. His run of success or luck as he might call it was something that, that really rewrites the record books to this day. David Haynes was an, an amazing man, a, a man probably uh, way before his time in the thoroughbred industry here in Australia. He was a, a, a gentleman who raced Kingston Town, bred Rose of Kingston, of course, the Dam of Kingston rule. And he was someone who saw an opportunity to breed to some of the best racehorses in the world. And he was pivotal in, I suppose, changing the perception of what the Australian thoroughbred industry was at that time. Kingston rule colours very famous, uh, very famous Australian colours, uh, the David Haynes colours, Kingston Town. Like he was the he was the headline horse, he was the pin-up horse of, of my career when I first started. Um, you know, I remember seeing him at the track and and so those colours are really dominant in, in, in racing at, 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 at that stage of uh, my career. Bart Cummings, he had a plan with, with the sprinters and he had a plan with stayers and he used to say to me all the time, he said it worked for my dad, he said, and it's working for me, he said, there's no reason to change it. I think after we won the cup with Roke and Josh, Gay Waterhouse said, Joe, how does he do it? I said, Gay, I said, if you've got every trainer in the world to start training their Melbourne Cup horses the first day that Bart did, and did exactly the same as what Bart did right until Melbourne Cup day, I said, not one, per not one trainer would do it. Bart Cummings training his 11th winner of this great race, turning around a horse from Western Australia, and turned him into a champion. When you look back on Bart Cummings' career, I think he was without peer as a trainer of staying horses. While he was very successful, won golden slippers, won plenty of sprint races, I think it is his efforts in training horses to win over two miles and to win derbies and oaks is just second to none. My father's involvement in racing uh, started in the, in the 70s. He was introduced to the idea of maybe breeding some horses through his great friend, Norman von Neider, who was an international champion golfer. And Dad managed to combine his considerable logic and his appetite for research and analysis and develop a simple idea of, of breeding a few racehorses into a dynasty. The interesting connection with Kingston Rule and Bart goes back further uh, through Kingston Rose. Bart sold Kingston Rose to David Haynes. Kingston Rose was a brilliant filly. She carried big weights and won a lot of races as a two-year-old. From Kingston Rose, David bred Rose of Kingston. I remember a rich colour, it was a golden chestnut. She had a beautiful head, she had a leg under her. Probably the most athletic filly I can remember of a time. She won a, 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 a VRC Oaks uh, and then went on and won an AJC Derby as well which is extraordinary for a three-year-old filly to beat the boys. Had the pedigree, but also had the, the, the CV to match. But it's Rose of Kingston for the Oaks. She's coming away, and Rose of Kingston outstays them to score well. Rose of Kingston, two lengths to Queen's Road. Rose of Kingston was, of course, a champion that David Haynes uh, 
bred and raced. Uh, she beat the Colts in the AJC Derby, was horse of the year. She was a great two-year-old as well. She won the Champagne Stakes, was placed in a golden slipper. And that mare, while being champion of uh, Australia, he spent the money, sent her over to America. And it's the Phillies Champagne Stakes. Rose of Kingston in front, close to home, and wins half length to Birchwood. Well, David Haynes made an interesting decision. Not only did he send a group of brood mares to America, he bought a farm there and called the Kingston Park in Kentucky. I remember at the time being quite sad that these horses were going to, these great brood mares, you know, Spirit of Kingston, Rose of Kingston, Kingston Rose, her mother. A lot of them went to France to be trained, including Kingston Rule, and, uh, and then filtered their way back. When he came back to Australia, he finished up with Tommy Smith at Randwick, and I don't think Tommy and the horse got on very well. In the relatively brief time that Kingston Rule was with TJ, um, Gay was very, very much part of TJ's racing operation and I used to enjoy sort of interacting with her. Uh, and when Kingston Rule had a much heralded first start in Sydney, he uh, ran badly on a, on a uh, weather affected track. And I remember Tommy ringing me up uh, and saying that uh, the horse hadn't performed to expectations. And he said to me it would be best if I removed the horse from the stable because he didn't believe he was very competitive. And I made the, the probably cheeky uh, mention that I'd spoken to Gay earlier in the week and Gay had said that Kingston Rule was going very well and she was happy with his progress. And TJ's words, I remember to this day, he said quite sternly, well, gay's gay and I'm TJ and I'm telling you the horse needs to, to go elsewhere, to be removed from the stable. Not a lot of people were giving Bart a horse. So he wasn't going to knock back Kingston Rule because Bart was going through those terrible times uh, you know, with uh, his failed syndication, which I think was something like 28 million or something. Uh, he owed, uh, owed the sales companies. And in the next fortnight, for reasons that will become clear, the auctioneer must make a momentous decision whether to sink the man who's become an icon in Australian horse racing into bankruptcy. In 1989, uh, Bart Cummings came to uh, the yearling sales that year and spent something like $22 million on thoroughbreds, on yearlings. Um, if you look at it in today's terms, you would look at perhaps the median sale price of a house in Sydney was around 250,000. So the value of 22 million at that stage is probably something like 100 million dollars today in the value that it could buy. So it was an enormous amount of money and it, it really did make a huge splash in the marketplace, particularly when you consider that Tommy Smith was spending a similar amount of money. So it, um, you know, the, the sale that year was off the charts. You know, horses that probably in previous years were making 200,000 were making half a million, horses that were making 400,000 were making a million and more. Three horses. We had, we had three horses at Flemington. I think people knew that because they, a lot of people were telling me that I should just leave. They said that Bart's gone, he's finished, he'll never come back from this. Um, a few trainers offered me a job. Um, for what reason, to this day, I'll never know why I stayed. I just stuck um, and, it was, and it was for the better. When we came up with the idea of holding the sale, it had to be something that would attract attention, not only in Australia, but around the world. So it was coined the Night of the Stars, and the sale was held on the 15th of September, 1989, to recoup uh, you know, what money we could. So I think the value of the horses offered at that sale was something like $20 million uh, that Bart had spent. Um, and they recouped around about 11 million, so about oh, not quite 60 cents in the dollar. So look, there was still a, a large amount of money owing after the sale, but um, at that time, it was a pretty good result to get that sort of money back in. He didn't say anything. All he said was, um, he said, we've got a horse off Tommy. <laughs> I go, oh yeah. And because uh, I, I remember Leon and I were there with him. He said, we've got a horse off Tommy. And, um, it's, and Luke goes, who's, who's is that? He said, oh, David Haynes. He said, oh, yeah. He said, oh, he said, I thought we'll take him. He said, we can't do any worse than Tommy did. So in, a, in other words, he thought, well, we can't lose. When Kingston Rule come into our stables, I remember him getting off the float and he was a beautiful looking animal, but he was very raw, very immature, um, had no meat on him. Bart didn't come to Melbourne. He had a lot of other things on. And basically during that time, Leon and 
Nigel were sort of able to do their own thing a little bit with Joe Agress as their track rider, uh, without the influence of Bart, apart from phone calls and uh, fax messages. Um, so they were able to sort of get Kingston rule and, and, and work on him and, and get him to the races. I was really happy with him, but I never, never thought for one minute that he could win a Melbourne Cup. When we gave him his first start, he ran second. That preparation, I think he ended up winning a couple of races. He had a couple of runs and he ran seventh in the Australian Cup and then he went for a spell and then he came back. And that's when, probably after he had his first or second start, just, six, just things started to happen with him. I couldn't be sure how Bart and Dad sort of concocted the plan towards the Cup, but certainly it would be any person's dream and given his dam had been good enough to, to win a derby and Oaks's and his sire had, had cleaned up in the Triple Crown, you know, there was every reason to hope and dream. Kingston Town, he was just a, such a wonderful horse. The fact that he couldn't win a Melbourne Cup, uh, I think is grated on David. Uh, I think David had a burning ambition to breed a Cup winner. He came out, he ran fourth in the Craigley Stakes to Zabil. And at that point, this was all the hallmarks of a Bart special. Kesem in front of Kingston Rule, stylish century. Kesem, Claire and Kesem will win it. Kesem wins it by a length and a quarter, Kingston Rule. Got beaten in the Coonji, he ran second in the Coonji, uh, over 2,000 metres, which was a race that he, he should have won on a, on a fourth in a, in a Craigley. And he got beaten and he, he got beaten and he got run over at the end, which was disappointing but it was a significant defeat because it made Bart realise that this horse had needed to have a rocket up in to get going. The first time I think Bart, he come down on the Tuesday before the Mooney Valley Cup, he said, oh, what do you think, son? I said, I said Bart, I said, he's really coming to hand, you know? I said, I don't know how far we're gonna go with him. He said, ah, oh, that's all right, don't worry, he'll tell us. <laughs> so then I was really, really happy with his work and I come back and Bart said, he said, what'd you make of that, son? I said, Bart, I said he was shitting on Saturday. <laughs> That's not the exact words I said to him. And he, he looked at him and he said, um, he said, that horse is too fat. They were told that he was too fat. Uh, I think Joe Aggressor in his book makes that point that uh, you know, they didn't think he was too fat, and, uh, but Bart said he's too fat. And, um, and uh, that he needed to have not only racing, but work. And I think Bart mapped out a program from then on to work the living daylights out of him. And uh, that's what they did. He said, if this horse wins on Saturday, he said, we'll improve him 10 lengths come Melbourne Cup day. I said, oh, okay. So I turned around, walked away, and I thought, silly old bastard. I thought, there's no way, in, I thought, there's no way in the world he could improve this horse 10 lengths. I, I thought we had him cherry ripe, yeah? And Hassam there, homeward bound, and Flying Luskin is the leader, challenged by Kingston Rule. Because well, he went on to the Mooney Valley Cup, that was the race that he needed to get a penalty. And, um, and get into the cup. Halfway down the straight, Kingston Rule applies the pressure, hits the front from Flying Luskin and then Chalaya, and Kingston Rule goes on to win. He ran a fantastic race. He stormed to the line. Cassidy rode him. Nearly ran a track record. The winner of the Lundridge and Wines Mooney Valley Cup, Kingston Rule, is a five years old chestnut horse by Secretariat from Rose of Kingston, raced by Mr. and Mrs. David Haynes, trained by JB Cummings, and ridden by Jay Cassidy. First group win for the horse. First time we, we, we thought uh, Bart's on the way to the cup. And Cassidy thought Bart was on the way to the cup because he, he was quoted after the race as saying, I've, I've, I've been offered a lot of rides, including just a dance of, with his mate, Rogie, uh, but this one goes to the top of the list. And history tells us he didn't ride him. <laughs> I got the call up to, to come down and to, to ride him in the Melbourne Cup, but I had to ride him on the Saturday um, on Derby Day in, in the, I think it was uh, Dalgetty or one of that, the, that, that name of the race, it was a 2500 metre race. I had to ride him on the Saturday and I said to my wife, Kim, I said, oh, I said, you know, I've got good rides here on Saturday. And I was so, lo like I was a stable rider for the Inghams, so I had to ring up uh, Mr. Jack and, and Bob Ingham to, um, to seek a release to go down and ride, it on the sat ride him on the Saturday. And they said, no, nah, go for your life. Before Darren Beedman come out, Bart said, he said, he said uh, what do you think? I said, about what? He said, do you think he can win? I said, if you want him to. He goes, you're an idiot. He said, don't be an idiot. He said, of course we want him to win. And I thought, well, I'm gonna follow Bart and see what he, what he says to Darren. 
I basically said, not word for word, but it was like, hit him like you're gonna hit me um, in the run. <laughs> so uh, in other words, you know, he was trying, but don't hurt him. Mount Olympus hit the front at the 300 metre mark. Kingston ruled a length and a half behind it. And he rode him in the uh, Dalgetty and rode him, rode him really well. Uh, that was the day David Hayes trained six of the eight winners. Three quarters, Kingston Rule, he's running out. Mount Olympus still in front and Mount Olympus will win it. Mount Olympus from Kingston Rule by half a length. Trained by David Hayes gives him six for the day, which must be a record on Derby Day. All the talk was about David and Mount Olympus winning uh, the Dalgetty, but uh, a lot of people who were worrying about the cup were watching Kingston's Rule's performance. I knew that that day, like, there was still a little bit left in the tank um, for Tuesday um, and you know it was it was it was basically sleepless nights coming into, Mel into the Melbourne Cup 72 hours later. So the Sunday after Derby Day I had the Trot and Cantery so he's running the Mooney Valley Cup, he's galloped at breakfast with the stars, he's galloped on the Thursday morning, he's raced over 2500 on the Saturday and I trotted and canned him on the Sunday after Derby Day and I thought to myself, on Monday morning I got him ready and I was trotting him around because we used to give him five, ten minutes trotting and that and Bart was up in the, up in the stand and I thought, this bloke's going to gallop him. I said, he's going to kill him. And I trotted him around and I went, I went up to the, to the hut and he said, what do you think, Joe? I said, oh, I think he's felt the run, Bart. <laughs> Try, trying to convince Bart not to gallop him. And he, he just went, <laughs> he goes, go a mile home two in 27 and look after him. That's the exact words. Look after him. On Melbourne Cup morning, he breezed him up again. Just a, just a little pipe opener. I was there that morning. I didn't see the work, um, but he was gleaming that horse. He, he, he's, it was like a, his coat was golden. He looked fantastic. You know, Melbourne Cup day, there's over 100,000 people there. The adrenaline's pumping, and, but you've still got to remain cool and calm and collected and uh, not let the horse feel the nervous energy. My father is not on the face of it a nervous person at all, except when it comes to horse racing. And I think the inevitable excitement and tension uh, through the race affects everyone. So whilst I would call him quietly nervous, there's no doubt in my mind he was feeling every bit of the stress and and excitement of the race. There's been terrific money for Kingston Rule and I'd say that in the last five minutes of betting Kingston Rule has been the most heavily supported horse on course. They're set racing. Kingston Rule a little awkward to begin down in the inside. Ali Boy jumped away okay. Jumped a little bit awkward but I was able just to put him into the right spot of being about you know five to six lengths off off the lead and um, they went along at a nice gallop. Normally it's a there's a little bit more scrimmaging going down to the winning post the first time, but it was, it was a pretty cleanly run race um, leading up to the winning post the first time. Meter mark and Savage tosses in front down the straight the first time. Savage toss in front, our magic man is second. Then La Tristia third, the inside followed by Donegal Miss Selwyn's mate, the outside. Now Botto next on the rails, followed further back in the field by Mr. Brooker, Kingston Rule, wonderful. But it was fast because Friedman had a horse in it from Argentina with a mad headstrong attitude. Savage toss uh, jumped to the front and just ran uh, and just bowled and bowled and bowled. Friedman had worked him out. He won the Werribee Cup leading all the way. Friedman jumped him to the front. Hit out of the straight and then terrific just a dancer. And Shalaya last of all as they head towards the riverside and towards the 2,000 metre mark in the cup now. And Savage tosses running along, leading by about a length and a half to our magic man. La Tristia is a nick away third, the inside, a break of about three lengths to Selwyn's mate, who's wide around the outside of Donegal Mist. And on the rails is Narbotto. About a length and a half further back is Mr. Brooker, Kingston ruled, and they're following. As we went along the riverside, you know, I was more than content that the horse, was, Kingston really just, he just went to sleep on me. The race didn't change complexion too much. There wasn't anyone taking off around and making mid-race moves, which can, you know, uh, cause a, a, a chain of events um, and interference. But it was, it was a relatively clean run race. 
800. It's Savage Toss in front. He leads three quarters. Our Magic Man and La Tristia. A length away as Selwyn's mate, who's had the run of the race fourth. And then Nabotto, Rising Fear, going around the outside, being trailed further back in the field then uh, by Donegal Mist. And next is Mr. Brooker. Kingston Ruled is back behind him on the rails, then Flying Luskin, Ali Boy and Aquidity. I guess once you sort of hit the the 1200 metre mark, then you start to begin on the circle, like being on the fence, it's shortest way home. Um, and they were running along. I wasn't getting any interference at all. Your boy, then Batuta, Shalaya, terrific second last, and just an answer still last. At the 800, coming near to the turn, Savage Toss in front, a half length, our magic man. La Tristia is third, and Selwyn's mate dropping out of it. Followed further back by Nabotto and Mr. Brooker coming into it. Back behind those horses is Kingston Rule and Flying Luskin as they turn the corner. And then Aquidity, Frontier Boy, and terrific well back Shazora ahead of those. They're into the straight. Field opened up. Um, as we turned for home and I ducked up on the inside of Narbotto and still had plenty of room in front of me because Savage Toss was about four lengths so I still had plenty of room to keep improving if I had the horse. Man tries to get him and Kingston Rules coming home very stoutly. Kingston Rule has hit the front. Here's Nabotto and Mr. Brooker. Kingston Rule in front from the Phantom diving up on the inside. Kingston Rule and the Phantom from Narbotto. It's Kingston Rule to give Barty's eight. Kingston Rule from the Phantom. Third is Mr. Brooker. My horse, he just stuck his head out and, and just charged to the line. It was an amazing feeling. Yeah, it's huge. Stand by for the placings on the Melbourne Cup. They've broken the record again for the second year in a row. And it's Bart again. Kingston rule. Darren Beedman has won the Cup, giving Bart his eighth win in the race. Well, the best bred horses ever seen in Australia, Kingston Town. What Some a moment for David known, The best known colours too, Dan, aren't they? They are Worldwide. bred in America. Secretariat, oh. the sire. Rose of Kingston, one of the best mares Australia has ever seen is the dam. He was bred to win a Melbourne Cup. They said he couldn't stay, but it was that master, the man who's got seven of them, John Letts, who's done it, put the polish on. Yeah, no, it was a... I'm getting a bit teary <laughs> talking about it now, so, yeah. I know, just, just bringing back the memories, I guess, yeah. Yeah, it means a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why that happened, but <laughs> it did. As Bart said, oh, I think I've got a bit of hay fever. <laughs> Certainly after the race, there was discussion that couldn't win it with Kingston Town. And here was this royally bred horse that virtually had come from nowhere to win a cup. And Haynes was just, he was the big player of the time of the previous 15 years. And, um, and it was probably important for him to win a cup. It's like a dream come true. I mean, uh, you bred this horse to be a champion. Right at this moment, he's the champion of the world, really. Oh yeah, I can't believe it. Uh... I've never really thought I'd win a Melbourne Cup. I've tried, but uh, this is the crowning uh, moment of our turf career. He felt that that was a bit of revenge or a little bit of a legacy that he needed to have. And uh, I, I know, you know, talking to him and Cathy and Cathy Haynes around the time, you know, it was just a joy for them to win it. Look, I think in trying to sum up our, our joy in, in being involved with the Melbourne Cup winner, Dad said it best when he was speaking to journalists after the race. And he said that with Kingston Town and his illustrious race record, he felt he'd had the sun and moon. Then Kingston Rule going on to win the cup made him realise he had the stars as well. I think that that was a, an extremely pivotal moment um, in my career in really establishing and a, and a launching pad to be able to go on to bigger things um, and gives, it gives you the confidence to be able to go on and you know achieve greater things. It felt like I'd, I'd climbed the mountain but obviously there's more mountains to climb but um, yeah it was an extremely pivotal moment. Um, you become part of Australian history, uh, racing history. Um, for that 12 months after you win the Melbourne Cup that cup's yours and and wherever you go it, it changes your life um, and you know wherever you go whatever you do it's an extremely important moment the rest is history he still holds the record and i think he was very very proud and honored to win that that melbourne cup because he never really showed off his horses that much but the next morning he said to me he said saddle that horse up Joe and he said and just give him a trot and a canter around the inside and he said then get off him and give him a pick of grass 
and I knew what, what he was doing because all the press were all there and wanted to talk to him and I think it was just a big relief off his off his shoulders uh, that he, he got back and we won another Melbourne Cup. He was a horse with great presence at uh, Kingston Rule and so when he won the Melbourne Cup I think that really did you know uh, put a stamp on the quality of the race. It was interesting it was at a, a time when things were about to change I think it was only a couple of years later that Dermot Well brought vintage crop out in 1993 and uh, the race changed forever but at that stage it was something I think Hyperno had been Bart's last winner so Bart had had a pretty lean spell and I think punters who had supported Bart on the first Tuesday in November many many years in a row who were probably starting to despair at trying to find another winner but he was to, uh, to start his resurgence with the uh, Kingston Rule. And this was pretty much the, the rebirth, the reboot of Bart Cummings and he would go on and train the next year's cup winner in Let's Elope, Saintly in 96 and Rogan Josh in 99 and then of course viewed in 2008. Well, I would suggest that Kingston Rule is the fastest winner of the Melbourne Cup and to that point with 316.3 he holds the record, he's impeccably bred, he's one of Bart's 12 Melbourne Cup winners and I suggest being the fastest winner of the race holds him in a unique category in the in the race's history. John 316, that's my fa like my favourite scripture, yeah. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It's a bit bit eerie, yeah, it's a little bit eerie. Some, I've, even now, like I, I, I sign my um, signatures, you know, John 316, and I signed the scripture there one day, John 316, and you know, didn't know whether the guy thought it was, you know, it was the Melbourne Cup time or what he said, but no, you even put the time on it at 16 minutes past three. <laughs>